Good morning, everybody. It's the Drive to School podcast. I am Pastor Goodman, your host, and my good friend David Zills is back. How are you? I'm doing okay. I'm on my second cup of coffee, and I need it, so this yeah. will be fun. It's 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 at the point where we're trying to limit. You know, I'm, I'm not going to drink more than a pot of coffee a day. That's the right amount. Um, we're gonna <laughs> I'm power not on yet. through. No, don't get there. It's not great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get I get the jitters if I start doing stuff like that. Yeah, I wonder if I would talk at a normal speed if I uh, if I just chilled out in the coffee. <laughs> That's funny. Oh well. All right. So we're we've been talking about uh, the deity of Jesus. That that is Jesus actually God. Um, and we sort of tackled the the sort of some of the bigger approaches that that he is is not a liar. That he is not a lunatic. But there's there's one more sort of important uh, word word that starts with the letter L to to cross cross out. Yeah, legend. Did Jesus actually say the things that we claimed he said last time by looking at what the Gospels record him saying? So, yeah, uh, we're talking about who is Jesus. And um, I think in all of Christian apologetics, this is the central question. There's a lot of stuff about does God exist? What do we do with timelines for the creation of everything? Um, What about the problem of evil? Why does a good God allow suffering? What about miracles? All these things. And I think these are all important. And they're for some people, some will be more important than other. But the central thing that you absolutely have to address is who is Jesus? Because that is where Christianity is different from everything else. And, um, you know, one of my friends has said, if, if Jesus is God, and if he rose from the dead, then that settles it. So I think I think this is the the central point that we have to focus on. And the point we've been making is that Jesus claims, as they're recorded in the four Gospels, and last time we showed it's not just John, it's all the Gospels, um, and it's not just titles where he says, "I am the Son of God," but it's it's multifaceted and pervasive. the The idea that Jesus claimed to be God, at least as recorded in the Gospels, limits our options in answering the question, who is Jesus? We don't have all the options we would have if Jesus didn't make these claims. And so what are the options? Well, the option that I think we want to spend some time on this time is that, well, Jesus never actually said these things. So then if Jesus never said these things, then where did we get the statements in the Gospels? And um, the idea here is called evolutionary Christology. So Mm -hmm. Christology is just a fancy word for what do you say about who Jesus was? Who was Jesus? And evolutionary means Christians' ideas about who Jesus was evolved over time. And so this is the way the theory goes, and this is the dominant Uh, view of among non-Christians, not just secular people, but Muslims, I think, would fall in this category. And the idea is that Jesus never actually said anything about being God. In fact, if he heard what Christians were saying about him today, he would roll over in his grave. But um, yeah, I put Jesus back in his grave. Um, But (laughs) but, uh, it fits with this theory. But if 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 the, then the idea is that as Christians who respected Jesus talked about him over time, their ideas about him grew. And it's kind of like the fish story where, you know, I caught this amazing fish. It was <laughs> it was six inches and then it was, you know, five feet and then it was 500 feet and with the minnow mm-hmm. goes and becomes a whale. And so the idea is that belief in Jesus changed. It evolved over time and the fish story got bigger until at some point. Christians started saying, yeah, Jesus, Jesus was God. And then the idea is over time, this became the majority Christian view. And that's why Christians believe it today. And we really have to take this seriously because this really is the dominant view today. Um, So, so I want to address it. Um, But real quickly, let's go over the other options. The other options are Jesus did say these things and there are three ways of explaining who Jesus was, if he actually did say these things. The first is that, well, he was right. He, he he was right about who he was. And so we would say another L word, he was Lord. He really was God. And this is the dominant historic Christian view today. We have to address, did this evolve over time? But it is the view of historic Christianity going back through the centuries. Now, if Jesus claimed these things, but was wrong, we have two remaining options. And they're 
similar, but um, slightly different. One is that Jesus was wrong and he knew he was wrong. So he was deliberately deceiving his followers about who he was. And so this is the liar of another L word, the liar view. Um, Jesus was a con artist. Um, or the, the final view is that maybe Jesus was sincere, but mistaken. So he sincerely believed he created everything, but he didn't. So um, I, I'd argue that anyone who sincerely believes something as outrageous as this isn't fully with it. And so they're a lunatic. Um, so we can, it's easy, I think, to deal with a liar and lunatic theories. Liar, we can point to Jesus' character, how he treated people, how he seemed to be incredibly benevolent and not malicious, um, how his teachings were very noble. We can look at, did he have a motive to pull off some kind of a huge hoax about who he was? And, you know, Jay Warner Wallace, the cold case cop that I talk about sometimes, talks about how when people have hoaxes and conspiracies, it's for sex, money, or power almost all the time. And there, we don't have records. Uh, we, we don't have, you know, the, the preponderance of evidence is that Jesus didn't get any of these things and he wasn't after them. And I think the thing that really um, puts a nail in the coffin of the liar theory is that Jesus died for his claims. We talked in the last two times about when Jesus was on trial and they were looking to kill him and they couldn't find charges. Um, the high priest asked Jesus point blank, are you the Christ, the son of God? And not only did he affirm it, but then he added to what the high priest said by combining two Jewish scripture passages in a way that ha hadn't been done before that unequivocally said in the Jewish context, yeah, I am Yahweh. And that was what sealed his fate. So if he was a con artist and he died for his con, that's, that's not, yeah, yeah, like no, nobody dies for a con. That's not, you don't die for a lie knowing it's a lie. As far as the lunatic theory goes, um, I, I have this quote from, I think psychiatrists and psychologists have looked at Jesus and they said, he's just too balanced he doesn't fit the profile of a lunatic. So um, I have from Josh McDowell's book, um, More Than a Carpenter, a quote from psychologist Gary Collins. And I just want to quote it verbatim because it's just very well said. He says, Jesus was loving, but didn't let his compassion immobilize him. He's balanced. He didn't have a bloated ego, even though he was often surrounded by adoring crowds. He maintained balance despite an often demanding lifestyle. He always knew what he was doing and where he was going. He cared deeply about people, including women and children who weren't seen as important back then. He was able to accept people while not merely winking at their sins. He responded to individuals based on where they were at and what they uniquely needed. All in all, I just don't see signs that Jesus was suffering from any known mental illness. He was much health healthier than anyone I know, including me, says, says psychologist Gary Collins. And another psychiatrist also mentioned in the Josh McDowell book talks about the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, if you take all the teachings and research about mental well-being and you get rid of all the fluff and you just boil it down to its essence and then you hand it off to the most gifted poets and have them write it it still pales in comparison to the sermon in the mount obviously this is subjective but this is coming from a trained psychiatrist so when you look at jesus life and teachings it just doesn't fit the profile of a lunatic and so john stott i think sums this up well in his book basic christianity when he says he got a letter from someone um, who said i just had a realization god almighty had two sons jesus christ was the first i am the second and then he looked at the address on the letter and it was coming from uh, basically a psych ward. <laughs> and so he said, anybody who makes claims like this, nobody takes them seriously. And the reason they don't take them seriously is because they don't seem to be what they're claiming. When we look at Jesus, he actually seems to be what he's claiming. His character supports his claims. And so I think the liar and the lunatic theories are pretty easy to debunk when you look at the life of Jesus, which is why I don't think they're the big views today. Um, it's 
easier to say, well, Jesus just never claimed these things, because if he never claimed these things, then you're not forced into this Lord, liar, lunatic situation. You can say, well, you know, he was just an ordinary guy. And I think that's where we have to focus. Right. Um, I, I mean, even just sort of looking back in a world where the supernatural was more readily seen, um, the idea that somebody would claim divine powers or, or even to be the divine, it, it, I, I feel like it would almost be taken more seriously than it would today where people are trying to reason away anything they can't see or touch. Um, that, that you come out and say, I am, I am him. Um, it, it's going to be something that, that will very quickly be looked at and dismissed if it's from somebody who clearly is is uh, rocking themselves in the corner uh, wearing a straitjacket. Um, but but more than that, um, to, to sort of call this a legend, it, it's, it's the simpler argument because then you don't have to contend with the scriptures at all. And, and this is really sort of the issue at, at hand, right? If, if you can duck outside of the book altogether, then you don't have to sort of look at it to say, well, did he make sense or, or did he actually say it? But, but you can just dodge the whole thing. Yeah, that that's exactly it. You basically say the scriptures are not valid. They're not scriptures. They're just books. And um, and I think it's good for the sake of argument to just treat them as books. So let's let's go with that. And the way I'd respond to that is say, let's look at the rest of history outside the four gospels and see what we can discern. And so hmm. uh, we had a conversation last year in the fall about what are the sources that talk about Jesus outside the Bible? And so one thing we can do is we can look at historical reference to Jesus and Christians going back through the centuries and trace how far back does belief in God, belief that Jesus was God, how far back does it go? And we're not going to look at the Gospels. And so there are a number of categories of sources in every category and every time period of sources, for the most part, we see Christians worshiping Jesus as God. So that's not what we would see if the evolutionary theory were true. So, you know, some examples, look at the generation of Christians after the apostles. It blew my mind that we have writings of Christians that early, but people like Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp of Smyrna, they were pastors in the early church. Many, if not all of them are said to have known the apostles. And if you look at their readings, a great, a great, book really edifying spiritually, but also illuminating historically is the Apostolic Fathers in English by, um, I think it's Michael Holmes is the editor, the translator, and it's a great translation. I got a seminary professor to vouch for that that was a good translation of the, of the original languages. And if you look at those three writers in particular, who we know who they are and where they fit historically, they say three things. Jesus was God. Jesus rose from the dead. And by the way, we got the message from the apostles. And the apostles were known people who were known to be eyewitnesses of who Jesus was. And so obviously in later Christian generations, this this belief is here, but already right after the apostles, you have people saying, we learned about Jesus from these specific people, the apostles. We believe Jesus is God and we believe Jesus rose from the dead. And so Within the context of Christian literature, the belief in Jesus um, being God goes back all the way to the beginning. Um, what about non-Christians? Um, so we have, um, we talked about this in that episode too last year, um, Pliny the Younger and Lucian both describe in the first two centuries Christians worshiping Jesus as God. Another point of corroboration, if you look at Paul's letters, so why do we talk about Paul's letters to back up? So one thing about the Gospels is that it's popular among skeptical scholars to date them late. It's obvious why this is, because if they're early, there's not enough time for the legends to creep in. So they have to be late if you're going to say that they're a legend. But even if you look at the late dates, say... Um, in the 80s to 90s AD, even if you look that late um, with these things being written, that's still half a century after Jesus' crucifixion. And that may seem like a long time, but how many people do we know who remember events 50 years ago? Like they're, they're, they're walking around today. 
And so even if the Gospels were written that late, which I, I think there's evidence that they were written much earlier, there mm -hmm. still would have been witnesses, including hostile witnesses, who would have said, no, Jesus never said that. Stop making up this this crazy stuff. There would have been hostile witnesses who could have set the record straight. Can we define the word hostile too real quick? Because I like hostile doesn't mean I'll be mean to you on Twitter. Hostile ah, means, thank you. you hostile. Know. So, right, right. Yes. So if there were people who disagreed with Christians, that's what I mean by that. Not hostile, uh -huh. but disagreeing people who said, no, I don't believe with Christianity. If someone were, if the gospel writers would say, Jesus said all these things, and so you should but worship him as God. If there were people who didn't believe that, and there were eyewitnesses who knew what really happened, they would easily point out, well, look, we have people who remember what Jesus said, and that mm -hmm. ain't it. So like, stop making this up. Right. And it got violent too, though, right? Like, like people were stoned for making these kinds of claims. Yeah, there was persecution. We have records of persecution um, from non-Christian authors, from Christian authors. It, it it was not necessarily universal, but in periods oh. and in times, there was definitely persecution. So there were times where there were people who wanted to disprove this stuff. There's this, this kind of uh, problem that we have that uh, when we want to make a, a historical case, we tend to start history when it's most convenient for us. And so it's easier to make the claims that like, this is a legend when you're looking at, at the church in the time of the Reformation, when the Roman Catholic Church had grown rich and corrupt by saying whatever they wanted to say. And there you're right that that would make a lot of sense. But if this is happening very, very early, like from the, the date of the resurrection, and in the, the period where it's not safe to make these claims, it's, it's a compelling argument. Yeah. Yeah. But where I was going, let's say, let's say we, let's say still, we want to ignore the gospels and let's say still, we want to say they're late. Right. Um, look at Paul's letters. So Paul's letters, it may seem weird to look at Paul's letters because they're in the Bible and he wasn't that he doesn't talk about the life of Jesus a lot. But the interesting thing is um, a lot of even skeptical scholars will say, even if they say not all of the Pauline epistles in the Bible are authentic. They do believe that some of them on the weight of the evidence are, and they believe that Paul was a real person who really was kind of who we understand him to be. And so the interesting thing is Paul's letters predate these late dates of the gospels. They're even earlier. And we see Paul saying, Jesus is God. He rose from the dead. And by the way, my message agrees with the other apostles. So it goes back as far as we can trace it. Um, you know, it, Paul says, my, my message agrees with the other apostles in Galatians 1 and 2. He talks about how he kind of fact-checked himself with apostles who, by the way, were in Jerusalem. So they were Jews. We'll get to that later. Um, he also says, Jesus, we'll get to the resurrection later, but he says Jesus was God. So some important passages, 1 Corinthians 8. Paul says he affirms the Jewish tradition that God is one from Deuteronomy, which is very important to understand what kind of God Jesus was claiming to be. And he says, yeah, God is one. And then in the same breath as affirming Jude, uh, Jewish monotheism, he says, yeah, and by the way, Jesus is on the same level as God the Father, co-creator of everything in first corinthians 8 and first uh, in romans you know famous passage we love as lutherans romans 3 he says you know the righteousness of god has been revealed to which the law and the prophets co you know it's it's a shorthand for the jewish scriptures they testify to it so he says the jewish scriptures have been saying this and here's the message and he talk gives shares basically the message of salvation in jesus in the same book in romans 9 he calls jesus the, the Messiah, who is God over all, forever blessed. Amen. And th these are just some examples. So Paul calls Jesus God, and he says this is consistent with Jewish scriptures. And so the fact of the matter is when we look at the record, we see belief in Jesus among Christians going back as early as we can trace it. Right. So how then do we, we start to respond uh, to people who are saying that all of those things should just be dismissed? Well, one way you could dismiss these things is you could say, okay, could, the belief in Jesus' resurrection goes back to the beginning, but still Jesus never said these things. So we still have to close the gap between yeah. the apostles and Jesus. And so that's the, the last thing I'd say in response, okay. which is 
you have to understand the mindset of the apostles and the earliest Christians. They were Jews who considered themselves Jewish in following Jesus. They thought this was the most Jewish thing they could do. And in Judaism, you don't say any created thing is God. That's like the for foremost sin. You don't say a human is God. And so they wouldn't have had reason. This this wouldn't have popped into their heads if they were practicing Jews. And in fact, if they had claimed it, they wouldn't have been able to consider themselves sincere Jews. But that is exactly what we see. We have references of the early church being in Jerusalem. We have this from non-Christian authors, Tacitus and Josephus. We have it from Christian authors that are early outside the Bible, such as Hegesippus. I don't know if I pronounced that correct, but he talks about the Jewish church in Jerusalem, which was led by James, the brother of Jesus. And he talks about the martyrdom of James. And this is, you know, a generation, according to Eusebius, a generation after the apostles that this 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 man was writing this and he says james when he was stoned um the brother of jesus in jerusalem they said can you clarify for us because we know you're a devout jew can you clarify for us who jesus is and he stood on the temple because it was kind of a setup and he said yeah why do you ask me about the son of man which again refers back to Daniel 7, a divine figure in human form. And then James says, the son of man, and he talks about him being coming on the clouds of heaven, which last time we talked about is something only deities That's do, true. and sitting at the right hand of the great power, meaning God. And last time we talked about how nobody sits at the right hand of God. No human can do that. You can't go into the Holy of Holies in the inner sanctum of the temple, except in a, on one day, if you're one person chosen in a specific way, following specific rituals. And so for him to sit down, Jesus to sit down in God's presence, combined with the clouds of heaven and the son of man is a claim to deity. And we hear James claiming this as a Jew in Jerusalem reported, you know, a generation after the apostles. So we see that the early Christians were Jews and it just doesn't make sense. They wouldn't have had this idea on their own. They had to get it from someone they thought was a reliable source. And I would argue the most logical person for them to get this from was Jesus. And so even if you ignore the gospels and you look at the rest of history, the the Gospels are not like over here in fairy tale land, and then right. there's history over here. They fit together like lock and key. They support each other. They help each other make sense, and it, 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 there's continuity between them. And so I don't think the legend view holds up when you look at the historical record. You kind of have to look for holes in the historical record and blow those holes to be bigger than they are and then put things in there that we have no evidence for and base your theory on that but that's not that's not um good reasoning that's not good inference it's not letting the data drive your beliefs and so i think if we're going to look at the historical data not just the gospels but also paul's letters also the earliest christian writers also early non-christian writers the weight of evidence is that Jesus really did claim to be God. That's compelling. Like I got nothing. So uh, we're, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, David. Yeah. One final comment. Yeah. This can seem dry, like, okay, this is a lot of logic and facts, but I think this is comforting Yeah. because um Sometimes, you know, you go, sometimes life is hard. Sometimes you go through tragedy. Sometimes you don't know which way is up. And so if faith, if belief in God is wishful thinking, or, you know, I just kind of hope it's true, when, when your world is shattered, that's not very comforting because then it's up to me to sustain it. And I don't even know which way is up. So maybe this is, you know, it's not comforting to say, well, this is just something I hope is true. But if you can point to facts and a historical record and show this, I can have confidence in this. This is real. It's something outside myself that I can have confidence in. Then when Jesus says things and offers us promises that God loves us and is working for us in all things, it's not just wishful thinking. It's something we can actually have confidence in, and it's something we, that can keep us grounded when life is hard. And so it's not just this abstract thing. It, it becomes very real when you get out in real life and have to navigate life and 
and face the harsh realities and the confusing stuff. Life is messy. And it gives you kind of an anchor point to say, I don't know what's true all the time in all these areas, but I know I can follow Jesus. I know that he's trustworthy and he's going to take care of me. David, thank you so much for joining us today. All right. Thank you so much. Have a good one. You too.